afternoon to talk about uh, civilian nuclear power plants. So let me get over here where I can see my own slides. Okay, I found this on the internet somewhere uh, recently, and I thought it was pretty cool. The genie is asked, I wish nuclear power was safe. It is done. And then the person asking says, nothing's changed. And he says, correct. Oh, that's the laser. Here we go. Okay. Uh, there's 400 and a question on the cartoon. What's the question on the cartoon? I just wanted Walter to explain to us the, the, the cartoon. We didn't get it. Oh, you didn't get it. Okay. Someone is asking the genie, having rubbed the bottle, I wish nuclear power was safe. And the genie says, poof, it is done. And then the person says, but nothing's changed. And he says, that's correct. Nuclear power plants are inherently safe unless. And next week we'll talk about the unless. And this week I'm going to talk about the power plants themselves. So, um, okay, okay, forward. Okay, there's 439 nuclear power plants around the world in some 30 countries. And we have the most here, around 92. 61 are pressurized water reactors and 31 are boiling water reactors. And I'll be talking a little bit about what that means and why. And uh, I was trained on uh, pressurized water reactors and so was Will. The largest plant under construction right now is in the United Kingdom and it's 1.7 gigawatts. And the largest uh, total capacity under construction is in China at uh, 15 gigawatts total over a number of different plants. So pressurized light or heavy water reactors is a design. Boiling water reactors, which is pretty much similar, and we'll look at the differences, but all we want out of this reactor container is steam. And once you get the steam out, it's the same as every other coal-fired plant or gas-fired powered plant. You're going to use the steam to do something and make electricity is mainly, basically what we want to do. So they have gas-cooled and advanced gas-cooled reactors, and that's kind of like a jet engine where the reactor is acting as the like a jet engine in the airplane. You're taking heat to go through some turbines that will generate electricity and the other end of the turbine shaft is the compressor and it runs just like a jet engine on an airplane. Light water graphite moderated reactors, there's a number of those and I'll talk about them in a little bit, but the one you will know having heard about it before is Chernobyl. Fast neutron reactors or breeder reactors also known as liquid metal cooled reactors. And there's a number of those around. That was what was going to be in and what was put in the Seawolf. When they were first building the reactors for submarines, it wasn't known exactly what was going to be best and what was going to work even because nobody had ever built them before. So one was going to be liquid metal cooled with sodium, potassium, combination, which is very dangerous when it's around seawater, but it gives you a higher temperature at a lower pressure in the reactor itself. So here's a size comparison on the right. The biggest square up there is for advanced gas-cooled reactors. It takes more physical space to build it. 
And as you go smaller and smaller, the smallest one is the CANDU, the Canadian Deuterium Heavy Water Reactor, has a less uh, geometric space. And the, the biggest dimension up there, if I get close enough, I can probably find out what it is. That's not on there. The littlest one is eight and a half meters, and then the biggest one is probably about 20 to 30 meters. But that's not important. So here's where they are. Pressurized water reactors are the most anywhere. And you can see, I'm not going to read the thing to you, but I'll tell you that there's boiling water reactors, USA, Japan, Sweden, pressurized heavy water. That was a Canadian and then also used in other places, a Canadian design, because they had kind of a cornered the market on heavy water. Advanced gas cool reactors, the UK has done a lot of that. Light water graphic, uh, Russia, gas cool reactors, fast neutron breeder reactors, Russia has some of those. But this shows you where the reactors are in the various countries. And I don't expect you to read it, but the U.S. is at the top with 92, and the Netherlands and uh, Iran have one, Armenia one, Belarus. But you can see that they're mostly in the developed countries. Here's where they are in the U.S., and they're kind of separated by region, the uh, ones in the upper right are in the northeast, southeast, middle U.S., and then the western U.S. Currently, nothing in uh, Alaska or Hawaii. These are nuclear power plants around the world. You can see on the left, we have the U.S., where they're scattered around the U.S., a little bit in South America, Central America, one in Cuba, uh, we saw that, and I think I showed a slide of that a few years ago when I talked about our cruise around Cuba. In Europe, you can see they're all over the place, but mostly in France and the UK. And in Asia, they're nearly all in uh, India, China, and Japan. So let's talk about fuel rods. I haven't talked about that before. So today, in your mind's eye, we're going to go back to 1950, in the early 1950s, when they were building and designing the reactor for the Nautilus. Nobody had ever done it before, so I want you to take your slide rule out of your pocket because they didn't have computers back then, and we're going to think about how to make this work. So we have zirconium, which nobody had done much with before. They had decided that the cladding of the fuels would be in zirconium. And the interior would have the uranium in it. And so we can't take a chunk of uranium and throw it in some water and call it a reactor. The uranium will possibly react detrimentally with the water. And the Certainly the radiation products from the fuel, if it were right in the water, would be a mess. And then that would make everything in the primary circuit radioactive to a high degree. So we have to do something. So we're going to make a uranium sandwich, just like you would make a peanut butter sandwich. So we're going to take about six feet of zirconium or zirconium alloy, which nobody had ever done before. They don't know how to, to uh, machine it. They don't know exactly what all its properties will be. And so we're going to make a little tray about six inches wide, possibly four to six feet or longer. And it'll have a little lip on each side all the way around on the four sides. And we're going to take our peanut butter knife and spread a bunch of uranium in it and then we're going to put the top on it, and we're going to do this in a vacuum so that we can not have air in the fuel rod after we make it because it's going to go from 70 degrees to 600 degrees, and the air would probably blow the rod open, so we have to do it in a vacuum. We have to weld it shut. Nobody had ever welded zirconium before. We have to make the uranium 
the peanut butter needs to be thinly spread on really thin bread because we don't want the fission products to escape through the zirconium and we don't want the heat to be trapped in a really thick slab of uranium because what we want to do is get the heat out of the reactor into the water so that we can make steam out of it. So that, that was the original way they were building it, and so they had to take their slide rules and figure out what the heat transfer properties were, how thick you should make these rods, how long they could be, what's going to happen after they've had a whole bunch of fissions going on in the reactor and you have these fission products is everything going to be contained is it going to make a bubble and kind of balloon out and warp itself so they didn't know how all of that was going to work out but they had slide rules and they had some really good engineers so that's one way you can make your fuel rod you stack a bunch of them together separated by a really thin channel for the water to flow through to take the heat out from the fission into wherever we're going to use the heat but you need to have enough water flow through there to take the heat out depending on how many fissions you're going to be causing so somebody had to figure out the hydraulics of water throw water flow through these assemblies and you would take a, a dozen or so of these peanut butter sandwiches, put them in a container to hold them together, and then you take a whole bunch of those fuel assemblies and put them in the reactor where the water can flow from the bottom up through the rods, extract the heat, and take it out to the steam generator. So now they're going really with cylindrical rods, and you can see there's a whole bunch of them, and they're really little and they have a little bit of space between them and with the cylindrical rods it's very easy to put instrumentation down in the reactor because you can put it in an empty rod and you can have temperature probes or nuclear probes or radioactive detectors or you can put a neutron source in there to help start up the reactor so it just makes it a lot easy on the far left you see what would be the inlet of the water going in to the bottom of the rods of this assembly. There might be 90 or 100 or more of these assemblies in a, in a reactor, depending on the size of the reactor and the, the length of the rod depends on the size of the pressure vessel. So it just, that made it easier to assemble. You could do that in a vacuum a little better than with a peanut butter sandwich. So this is how they are now. And you see the bottom, the nozzle is going to direct the flow through all of the fuel elements in the fuel assembly. So that's enough about fuel rods. Why do we do pressurized water? Why do we use water at all? It's cheap and it doesn't uh, react very much with the uh, uh, absorbing neutrons. It's safe. It isn't going to react with, the, uh, react with the metals in the reactor. It's not too corrosive. Water by itself is not the, going to be too corrosive on anything that's in the reactor. They're building this stuff out of zirconium and stainless steel. It has a negative temperature coefficient of reactivity, which I tried poorly to explain a few days ago. Uh, in the slots where the water is going through the, pre the fuel assemblies, if it heats up, the water expands a little bit, and that makes the hydrogen molecules of the water a little bit further apart. So you'll get a little bit less neutrons slowing down from the fast neutrons from the fission. And then you can, it's sort of self-controlling over a small range of temperature and pressure. It has low neutron absorption cross-section because uh, hydrogen doesn't have a lot of room to get some more neutrons in it and the uh, oxygen doesn't care much. So basically you're not gonna lose a lot of, elect uh, of neutrons into the water. It has, has a high neutron scattering cross-section because the 
hydrogen molecule is the same size as the neutron, so it's like bouncing billion bars against billiard billiard bar, balls against each other on a billiard table, and they sort of transfer energy very well from the cue ball to the other balls. It's not very radioactive. Now, the hydrogen will absorb neutrons slowly, and then they will become slightly radioactive because it prefers to stay in the state of one proton, one electron, and the extra neutron sometimes is just released. What about heavy water? Heavy water is the same, and it's not heavy like that, but that was a cute little thing I found. The heavy water, the hydrogen isotopes, you have normal hydrogen 1 on the left, and deuterium, which is hydrogen 2, one proton, one neutron, one electron. The high cost of heavy water, because you can't just go to the store and buy it. Uh, Canada had a good market for it. Norway had a market for it from the mountains in Norway. And during World War II, the Germans were only using heavy water to try to make a reactor. And so they were trying to get the heavy water from Norway across a lake down to the railroad and to get it into a ship and over to Germany. And the uh, UK Rangers had a plan for that. They went and they sank the, uh, the ship in the lake. So there's barrels and barrels of heavy water at the bottom of that lake in central Norway. You can use natural uranium with heavy water, which is a great advantage because huge cost savings in the fuel. You just go dig up some uranium and you can make it into a fuel for a heavy water moderated reactor. It's safe, not too corrosive like regular water, negative temperature coefficient of reactivity like regular water, but a very low neutron absorption cross section because heavy water already has an extra neutron in it. And so it's uh, three zeros, 52 barns, very, very small cross-section for deuterium versus 0 0.332 barns for hydrogen, uh, 500 more or less factor there. Fairly high neutron scattering cross-section, even though it's got an extra neutron, it's not it's only twice as big as a regular hydrogen, so it'll still do a very good job of slowing down the fast neutrons in the reactor. And it's not very radioactive at all, so it's not a big problem in terms of radioactivity. So here we have, this is a, just a little cartoon again to show you what the terms are. You have on the left, the reactor containment vessel, and its job in life is to make steam. And the steam output is measured in thermal megawatts. So megawatts thermal is what's coming out from the reactor. Some of that is used to power the pumps and the other electronics that go in the reactor complex. So that's the gross megawatts electric and after you've used a little bit for your own good, you have net megawatt electric, and that's the net electricity you can put out on the grid. So you have to take the steam out. It goes through a turbine, and as it expands through the turbine, it rotates the turbine, makes electricity out of the generator, and it will be condensed in the condenser back to water using some kind of a cooling water source to enable you to get the condensate. And you pump it back into the reactor, and it goes around and around the circle. The red there is showing you the primary coolant system, and that is the water that goes through the reactor to make the steam in the steam generator. You can see the U-shaped tubes there, and the, blow, the blue at the top is steam generated and taking out 
and run through the generator. Once all that stuff on the right side is standard engineering from uh, hundreds of years of making generators, turbines, and so forth. So here is, we're seeing it better here. You can see the pump with the little red circles running around. That is the primary coolant system with the yellow and red water. The red is to indicate that it's heated up. And it goes through the steam generator to make the steam and goes out to the turbine, as we talked about before. But we have a pressurizer there. And why do we have a pressurizer? We do not want steam near the fuel assemblies or the fuel rods because steam has a much lower ability to absorb heat than does water. So we want to take the water to get the heat to make the steam. And we don't want steam there because the steam can actually, if you had a big steam bubble or near a control, uh, a uh, fuel element, you could have it melt down. We'll talk about that next week. So the first nuclear plants connected to electric grid in Russia, they had the uh, power plant. It was really for production of plutonium and they could make some electricity. It was a 30 watts thermal megawatts and five megawatts electric. And 56 Calder Hall in the UK, gas cooled plutonium production plant also could make some electricity. 57, the uh, Wills Army Reactor, SM1 at Fort Belvoir. It was the package plant. And it 10 megawatts thermal, but only like 1.8 or 2 megawatts electric. The Vallecitos boiling water reactor, it was a, a, a uh, research reactor out in California. It has the power reactor license number one from the AEC. And it was five megawatts electric, but it was mostly to discover facts about running a boiling water reactor and how to control it and what to do. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So, but in December of 57, the shipping port reactor came online. It was the first purpose built reactor. Rickover was assigned by the Atomic Energy Commission to supervise the design, construction, operation. It would be a pressurized water seed and blanket. So it was actually going to produce some plutonium in the blanket. The, the reactor inner circle of the pressure vessel and the reactor core was the uranium. But as we learned before, uranium fissions with some fast neutrons and the fast neutrons have to be thermalized. But if you put some more U-238 around the edge of the reactor, you can let some of those neutrons escape and be absorbed in the U-238. and You'll end up later with some plutonium-239. And at that point, they needed to get more plutonium-39 to build up the weapons program. So let's, let's look at this a bit. The AEC, starting in 1946, they dreamed of having nuclear electric power plants, but they weren't doing anything about it because they had just finished building bombs and that was what they were really doing. But they had a group at uh, Oak Ridge that was looking into making nuclear power plants for electricity. 51... Rickover had already ordered some long lead time pieces of equipment for an aircraft carrier. And he wanted to build an aircraft carrier in addition to the submarines. The nuclear research labs all wanted to get in on the game because there would be civilian prototypes and lots of R&D dollars. And that was what they wanted. So those would be like Knowles Atomic Power Lab, Bettis Lab, Argonne Laboratory, and Oak Ridge. The USN sort of wanted an aircraft carrier. It didn't want one 
they were still going through the the routine. A lot of the admirals wanted big battleships because they could live on them and fight big wars. But they wanted an aircraft carrier. The AEC wanted an operational power plant. It also wanted plutonium for weapons. Congress and the president wanted something to show about civilian uses of nuclear power. And there was a lot of infighting among all of the participants about who was going to get the dollars, who was going to run the program. And the power companies like uh, Florida Power, all the, all the regular power companies, they wanted in on the game too because the government was going to pay for everything. And if you can get the government to pay for everything, you want some of it. The commercial power plant was assigned to Rickover because he had a, a short history of showing that he could design and build a nuclear power plant. So construction began in Duquesne, electric power plant, and we'll take a look at that in a minute. But when you can see the much infighting going on, you do not want to be on the other side of Rickover when some infighting is going on because you were most likely going to lose. 57, it was operational. So this is where the shipping port power plant is located on the Ohio River, northwest of Pittsburgh. Here is a picture of the plant down near the river. And this is the pressure vessel arriving on the train we can all remember steam-powered locomotives, but that just shows how big, that's just the pressure vessel that they will contain the reactor. Here it is being installed in the building area. Oops, and that's a pressurized reactor. We'll talk about reactors a little more in a minute, but this is the uh, Canadian deuterium reactor. It's the same kind of a reactor as the pressurized water, it's pressurized heavy water. The flow of the uh, primary coolant is horizontal instead of vertical, and you see some schematic control rods there under the label of three. Four is the pressurizer again, five steam generator pumps, hits, you get heat, you have steam. Okay, the Kandu reactor, in China, it's two plants, Canadian deuterium reactor, pressurized heavy water, Three Mile Island. We've heard of that before. On the banks of the Susquehanna River, two reactors, each having two cooling towers. And you can see the cylindrical buildings there. Those are TMI-1 and 2. They are the same as the Crystal River reactor. It's a Babcock and Wilcox pressurized water reactor. And in Crystal River, besides having the reactor there, they also had uh, Florida Power, not Florida Power and Light, but Florida Power was running the electricity in that area of the state and owned the reactor. Um, and it's the same as these. So the Harrisburg International Airport, Three Mile Island nuclear power plant in the background, just to show you where Three Mile Island was. And this is the a schematic of the Babcock and Wilcox pressurized water reactor. And now we can see the pressurizer. The, the function of the pressurizer is to build up the pressure of the primary coolant far above the boiling point of the temperature at which the primary coolant is circulating through the plant. That way you will never get steam bubbles in the reactor vessel itself. But at the top of it, you see a safety valve and there's two other blocking valves and PORV is pressurized, pressure operated relief valve. And they are designed to go before the safety valve goes. Safety valve is there for just a high pressure event. But what is the pressurizer? It's a cylinder, stainless steel, probably several feet high, possibly a foot in diameter, maybe a little bit more. 
and it has electric heaters in it. The electric heaters heat the water and it's all connected together. So if you pressurize the water in the pressurizer, you've pressurized the whole system. And that will prevent you from having steam in the reactor vessel itself when all is working well. So that reactor building is some three to five feet of concrete and steel to contain any reasonable accident that might happen. The rest of it on the right-hand side is just steam stuff. But after you get the steam condensed back to condensate, in this case, they're using a cooling tower. Uh, I mentioned uh, last week or the week before, the cooling towers at Crystal River are not for the reactor plant. They were for the steam plants. But here we have the cooling water circulating back and there's a condensate pump whose job is to pump the water out of the condenser and give it some pressure before it gets to the feed water pump. And the main feed water pump goes from maybe 100 pounds per square inch or something like that up to about uh, 1,500 pounds per square inch to put the water back in the reactor. The water in the reactor if you have a temperature of 480 degrees, more or less, uh, which is about where the naval reactor is operated, your steam is about 600 pounds per square inch. And so the pressurizer is probably running at 1,000 to 1,500 pounds per square inch. I don't remember the number exactly. In the commercial reactors, they wanted to go to higher pressure steam because the more pressure steam, the higher the temperature of the steam, the more energy you can extract in the turbine and you can be more efficient at making electricity. Same with the coal-fired power plant. If you run the temperature up and put it into the turbine, you get a lot more power for your expenditure of energy to get it there. So remember about the safety valve and the blocking valve and the pressurized relief valve and the pressurized relief tank. Next week, we will talk about all of those and the main feed water pumps. And there's actually another line of emergency feed water pump that's kind of the same as the main feed water pump. And we'll talk about that because they were a problem at Three Mile Island. Boiling water reactor, they said, well, why don't we just boil the water in the reactor and get rid of this expensive, heavy, you know, six inches or more of the pressurized steam generator and all of the pipes that have to go through the steam generator and not leak. And so we'll just run this, this reactor and we'll allow it to boil not down where we're going to have a real problem with it, we hope. But you'll take the steam directly into the turbine and through the condenser and back around. It's the same thing. The steam plant doesn't care where the steam came from. But the water going through the steam, through the reactor, <clears throat> will become slightly radioactive. And then if you have any impurities in the water that's going back into the feed water, into the reactor, they can become radioactive. So your turbine and your steam pipes and everything in the steam plant might become slightly radioactive. So they have to deal with that problem in the design of the plant. And the, the uh, steam turbine rooms are designed to contain any small amounts of radioactivity that might be there. So if we look at them in comparison, the side-by-side -side view, you can see in the upper left, we have the steam generator and its complexity and the primary coolant cycle and its complexity. And all of this is running at like 600 degrees maybe higher in the civilian plants. It may be running uh, closer to 800 degrees. And if you look at the one on the right and the lower right, you don't have any of that inside the reactor 
pressure uh, containment. So it is a simpler system with some design problems, uh, but it's been working and they're very generally very safe. So this is a schematic of a boiling water reactor. You have to have a couple of pumps, recirculation pumps, to make sure the water is circulating in the reactor. And you, had to, you have to add water to the reactor because you're taking the water out as steam, running it through the turbine, condensing it, and putting it back in the reactor to make sure that the core is always covered. They have a steam separator and a dryer. If you have wet steam, <clears throat> which is almost what we have in the naval reactors because it's not superheated, superheated steam is a temperature is above the pressure of the steam. And natural steam or saturated steam can have droplets of water and they can impinge on the turbine blades and cause you erosion and wear. So here we have a separator and a dryer, and the steam goes out through turbines as before, through a condenser, condensate pump, and you see the demineralizer. The demineralizer is like the one you would put in your house for a water softener. It's, it's little uh, spherical pieces of plastic that have a tendency to absorb the uh, What's the right word? Uh, the bad stuff that's in the water. Any kind of uh, impurities. Love it. Thank you. Here's the laser pointer. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, to absorb and filter out the impurities to, so they will not be able to get back through the reactor and become radioactive. It's a radioactive a particle eliminator. So up there in the top, you can see three to five feet thick or one to one and a half meters. So this is a boiling water reactor. All the boiling water reactors in the U.S. are designed by General Electric. Originally, Argonne National Lab was tasked with the design of boiling water reactors, but nobody was using them very much for 15 or 20 years until they came up and they redesigned things and they came up with the pressurized uh, boiling water reactors. So this is another view. There's some toroidal tanks around the bottom. If there's steam leaking into the uh, reactor area, it would tend to condense into water and go down and be in the toroidal catch tanks. You see on the upper right, the SFP is the spent fuel pool. They can take the spent fuel out when they refuel the reactor and store it in the pool right next door because they're required to store it on site until they figure out what they're going to do with all the spent fuel that we have. Okay, uh, enough of that one. This is just another design example. Uh, and let me show you. This is the, the one that you see typically in the Fukushima plants. It's a General Electric Hitachi design with the Mark I containment. So you have secondary containment. The primary containment is around the reactor vessel. You have the miscellaneous pumps and the, the wet well and the dry well and refueling. Up in the upper right, you can see an overhead crane. The pressurized water reactors have the fuel of the control rods are on the bottom. And so it makes it much easier to refuel these because you don't have to deal with removing the pressure head, which has control rod mechanisms going through it. Because if you take the whole thing off, you have basically your uh, unpressurized water bomb. So with this, they can keep the control rods in. They can take off the steel cap that you see on the top of it. And there's a concrete containment vessel over top. You take all of that off and you have access to the fuel rods and you can refuel the reactor. 
without having to deal with the control rods. It makes it a little easier. And the storage is right there, so you don't have to move it away from this building with all the security requirements into another place where you have the spent fuel storage pool. This is what Fukushima reactors look like. There are six of them, two on the far right, and uh, the four in the middle. We'll talk about which ones of those were bad, but basically the, this is Fukushima, where the Fukushima disaster took place. So that'll be the exciting part of next week. Okay, here we're now into a gas-cooled reactor system. And like I said, it's, it's kind of like, well, no, this, sorry, I'm in the wrong slide here. Uh, it's gas-cooled, but it has a steam generator. So it's it's got uh, graphite moderator, carbon dioxide is the coolant, and the pumps around there run the gas around, extract the heat from the reactor, make steam, and we know what they do with the steam. Okay, UK advanced gas cool reactors, there are a number of them. When they came online, when they are due to be closed down, all this closing down of reactors in Europe is undergoing a review with the problem with the Russian gas pipeline under the uh, Baltic and the gas line coming through uh, into Germany for distribution throughout Europe. Uh, they're looking at maybe we aren't going to close down these reactors because we kind of like having electricity for our industry and for our people. These are the locations of some of the UK reactors and what they look like and where they are up near Edinburgh, this one in Torness. This one over in Hesham, I guess you would call it. Now let's go to the RBMK, Light Boiling Water Graphite Moderated Reactors. So it's the same sort of a cycle, but the water is not really the moderator. It can serve as part of the moderator, but it's graphite moderated. So you can see the little lines coming up through the top are control rods. The reddish stuff is the heated water coming through the, the uh, jacket around the fuel rods and going into the steam separators and steam going out into the steam plant. This is the reactor that's in Chernobyl and the reactor that's in the unpronounceable other Ukrainian city that's being occasionally bombarded and it depends on who you talk to, who's doing the bombarding. But the International Atomic Energy Agency has said those reactors are extremely unsafe right now because they're not being operated properly or supervised. Even though those reactors are in a section of Ukraine controlled by Russia, they are allowing the Ukrainian trained operators to run the plant. So it's a bit scary. So this is another look at the the Fukushima, uh, excuse me, the uh, Chernobyl type reactors. If you see on the top, you've got this concrete all around it. You have your fuel bundles. The water flows around the fuel bundle, and it goes through the steam pipes at the top. Turns into steam, goes in the steam generator, but if you look at it, if you see at the top where it says pressure tubes, that's where the steam is being collected and going into the steam generator and out to the other part of the plant. But there's, there's not a containment vessel as such around the whole reactor complex. And when we talk about Chernobyl next week, we'll see why that's a really bad design feature. Another design feature of this reactor is that the steam void, when you generate steam down around the, the uh, fuel rods, the steam void has a positive temperature coefficient because there's less 
water that could moderate, I mean, that could uh, interfere with the neutrons going into the fuel rods, the neutrons are more easily capable of going in from the moderator into the fuel rod because it doesn't have the water in the way it has steam. And these pl plugs at the top are also a problem because with Chernobyl, they blew off. Chernobyl, Ukraine, you can see Kiv down at the bottom and you can see where uh, the Chernobyl plant is. And let's see if I can find the other name up there. I can't see the other name, but up, it's further east. But in the at the very top, you see the Palyeski State Radiological Reserve. That's where the majority of the Chernobyl accident radioactive particles landed. We'll talk about that next week. The fast neutron reactors. They're, they're a step beyond. It's, it's pretty much like the uh, sodium reactor, sodium potassium reactor on the Seawolf, but you're not worried about thermalizing the neutrons, it operates at a fast neutron reactor, and it, it becomes a breeder as well. So they claim it'll be more efficient use, and it, it can be because you can get higher pressure steam with a lower pressure in the reactor by using a metal, liquid metal, to extract the heat from the reactor and it can burn some of its nuclear waste because it's still, it's there and it can be burned to some extent. They have 400 reactor years of operating experience and the generation four reactor are largely fast neutron reactors and their international collaboration on the design and operation supposedly proceeding with high priority. So here's your fast neutron reactor Primary coolant is sodium, liquid sodium, sodium, and it can run at 1,500 or more degrees at very low pressure in terms of what the reactor vessel has to sustain. They have to have a pump. There are electromagnetic pumps that pump the sodium around to extract the heat from the reactor through a steam generator, and this one has a secondary sodium loop. So it's sodium to sodium so that you don't have the radioactive sodium from inside the reactor going to make your generator steam, uh, to steam generator on the outside of the reactor plant. So it's very similar. You, you have high temperature to make steam and use the steam. Okay. The world's most powerful operation, fast neutron reactor, Unit 4, Beloyarsk in Russia. Beloyarsk, that's a pretty poor map. You see the arrow pointing at, it says Yekaterinburg, which is where they assassinated the last Romanovs, and Moscow is in the middle left of the picture, so it's part way out toward the Urals. Okay, nuclear power, pros and cons. It's a low carbon footprint. And now the Department of Energy is now talking about rejuvenating the nuclear power programs as part of the new uh, inflation protection, whatever it is, Bill, that just went through. There's money for energy exploration it's high operating availability. When you have a nuclear power plant, basically once you've tested it out and you've gotten it up to initial criticality and operating speed, you run at 100% power until you turn it off. It's not good at load, not sharing, but load res responding to load level changes. In the daytime, you need more electricity for your uh, energy 
uh, hogging manufacturing plants and other steam and heat processing plants and your air conditioners in your house and everywhere else. At nighttime, you don't need that as much. So typically, a, a power company will have some coal plants or some uh, gas-powered plants that respond very easily to a load, sh load shifting back and forth. And you just run the reactor plant at full speed nearly forever. The initial fuel cost is very high, but it can be spread over 10 to 40 years. They're now developing fuel elements or fuel systems that can last for 40 to 60 years. With the new Navy reactors for the aircraft carriers, they're designed for like a 60-year refueling cycle. The submarines that I was on would have a two- or three-year refueling cycle, and uh, we had... Uh, like 30 megawatt or 60 megawatt reactors, but they had to be refueled because they didn't have the new technology and the, the computers to design how you can load the fuel into the fuel rods to, pro, to allow you to run them longer before you have to refuel. The cons, high initial cost, a billion or more, and it's really more to make your reactor and the time for approval can be up to five years because what they had been doing you want to build a babcock and wilcox reactor send us all the paperwork of everything you're going to do with it where it's going to be located what are all the safety requirements what are the radiation requirements and then we'll look at it you're paying interest on the loan before you ever become operational. So you may have a one to three year period of time where you have borrowed money to build your reactor and you're paying interest on it. And at Crystal River, they were designing a new set of power reactors, nuclear plant, two reactors to be placed not too far from where the current one is and so they borrowed money and they were going through this and they've decided not to build it. But guess what? The rate payers are still paying the interest on those loans until they paid off. The stockholders in Duke Energy and Florida Power were not sharing that cost. There's no return on investment until the power is produced. NIMBY, not in my backyard, you're not going to build one of those nuclear reactors. Nuclear waste, what are we going to do with it? Right now it's on-site storage. There's no ultimate disposal. The naval reactors, as they are retired, the, the pressure vessels are taken to Idaho, which really doesn't want them anymore, but they're buried in the desert out there. With the exception, I believe, the sodium reactor prototype at West Milton, New York, I think is buried on site. Do you know, Will? Ah, which was a nuclear, uh, that was a uh, plutonium production facility of the Atomic Energy Commission built after the war. But nobody wants to have that in their backyard. And decommissioning costs can cost almost as much as building the initial reactor because you have to have a plan that says, what are you going to do with every little thing that might be radioactive and where are you going to put it? And you have to re retor the, return the site to its normal condition before you built the plant there. Insurance cost. If you have a, one of these reactors, there is a huge, huge cost to insure the reactor in the surrounding area the government has a big sharing of the cost of insurance with the power companies, but it's still a large cost. Now this, you don't need to study this very much. Yellow is nuclear cost, black is coal, and uh, blue is the gas. So it's comparing the relative cost over time by different people who did the study. And in every event, except the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK, all the others show that nuclear is going to cost more than anything else you do. 
This is just a, a cost per install capacity offshore wind and you're showing that the offshore wind, the onshore wind and the solar prices per gigawatt are going down. Nuclear is going up, coal is about constant. So this is kind of relative cost and benefit of different sources of power. Okay, what are we gonna do with the radioactive waste? In the US, you're paying a tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour surcharge on your electric bill. And I don't know where the money goes, but it's supposed to be for ultimate uh, disposition of the uh, radioactive materials. Canada is 1% of your utility bill. In the UK, low-level waste, it doesn't say per kilowatt hour, but low-level waste is about 2,000 pounds per cubic meter. Now, what is low-level waste? It, it's nuclear waste, but it could be the gloves that you use to do your uh, chemical analysis with or other instruments that are not radioactive um, waste products themselves, which are highly radioactive. So high level waste is 67 to 200,000 pounds per cubic meter. But what does that mean? So in the UK, you might have low level waste, about 80% of all of the radioactive stuff you have. It could be a piece of stainless steel that got radioactive, maybe part of the turbine that had some spillover of radioactive materials, but it's not considered to be really high level nuclear waste like you have inside the fuel rods. And 20% would be high level. So one reactor in the UK, maybe 12 cubic meters of high level waste annually. Annual cost of 1.2 million pounds. Future cost reduction ideas and, and what they're talking about now from the Department of Energy and Bill Gates and other people that are jumping into the fray, pre-approved standardized design. It's something that is standard. It's going to always be built exactly the same to all the same specifications. And it, it can be then approved as, hey, here's your plant. That part's already approved. Then they only have to worry about the local area where they're going to build the things. New fuel modules for longer life. I was mentioning that now we're going for like 60 years in the aircraft carriers and 40 to 60 years in submarines. And it's quite likely that the ship will be out of be obsolete and, uh, and out of service before the end of the nuclear power uh, fuel rods. Spent refuel reprocessing and use to some extent you can take spent fuel and if you process it in a highly radioactive environment with very extra special care, you can take some of those products and put them into a fuel rod and use them again in a reactor, particularly if it's got the plutonium in the component of the uh, radioactive leftover. Okay. This is the Westinghouse AP1000. Standardized, simplified approval for multiple plants of identical design, passive emergency core cooling system. We'll talk about that next week. That means you don't need to have electricity on the site in order to have the reactor cooled and protected from uh, fuel meltdown. Utilizes proven engineering design in the components, but there's some plants in Georgia that were supposed to be uh, of this standard design and they're still working with them. They are years behind schedule and 10 to $20 billion over the original cost estimate. So, so far the, the design for a standardized plant has not been well implemented. I'm not sure it can be. Okay, these are the GE Hitachi advanced reactors. Those are the 
boiling water reactors. They claim to be safer than anything else. And with the new passive cooling requirements, they won't have the problem of Fukushima. We'll talk next week about what was Fukushima's problem, what was Three Mile Island's problem, how can we prevent them in the future designs, and what action was taken to fix it. So this is some propaganda from GE Hitachi on how good their reactors are. A prism is the sodium cooled reactor. Uh, Bill Gates is interested in one to be built on the site of a coal mine in Wyoming. So the coal miners will have a job they can go to if they built a new nuclear plant. But it, it has an interesting design the sodium is the coolant, but they're storing some of the energy in molten salt. So it can make uh, about 550 megawatts running, but it's putting out maybe 400 megawatts to the electric power grid. But if it needs more electricity, they can extract heat from the molten salts and use that in the steam plant to do some load leveling on the uh, energy requirements. Okay, this is the, that reactor, simplified construction, all the good sales points that may or may not uh, come to pass. So in the bottom line there, Bill Gates is involved in the demonstration site in Wyoming. But the one thing, because it's the reactor itself is running at a much lower pressure because you don't have the steam pressure associated with the reactor or in a boiling water reactor or on the pressurized water reactor. Liquid sodium boiling point is not much above room temperature and you can run it at a couple thousand degrees F and the, you're not increasing the pressure significantly above room pressure, there'll be some pressure to just keep everything contained. Okay, future of fusion power. Woohoo, here we go. Not much future, I'm sorry. Uh, it offers the prospect of great and efficient and way less radioactive power generation there are some unresolved engineering challenges. The fundamental challenge is to, you have to achieve the heat necessary to cause the fusion to take place. And you're talking like 50 to 100 million degrees Fahrenheit, but not at high pressure, but still 50 to 100 de million degrees. So how are we going to do that? The tokamak is one of the ideas. It's an electromagnetic uh, confined gas, and we'll take a look at it. On the left, you see a couple of different magnetic fields, and the blue purplish thing is where the plasma is going to be heated and rotated around inside this, excuse me, toroidal plasma, oh, a containment device. And the idea is to get it up to a really high temperature and you'll have fusion, which gives you heat. But with the fusion, you're taking deuterium and tritium and turning it into helium. And that does not give you a whole lot of radioactive byproducts. You're going to get um, a neutron. So neutrons can be contained and, and uh, shielded very easily or if not easily, very inexpensively. But right now, there's only been one microsecond or thereabouts where they have achieved getting more energy out than they put in to get the thing brought up to temperature. It's very difficult, and it may or may not ever come to pass. The one on the right is one that I had heard about 30 years ago. If you can take some uh, tritium, and put it in a little glass cylinder or plastic cylinder and stick it in the middle and you hit it simultaneously with a few hundred lasers to implode it. And that would cause the temperature to go up and it would become a fusion reactor 
and you can get some energy out of it that way. They're still working on that. The future is not so bright for it. We've spent billions and billions of dollars in research. Okay, so that's that was today. Next week, we're going to have uh, a discussion of various problems. So there's a big problem in 57 in Russia. Then we have the SL-1 reactor, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima, radioisotope spills, Russian submarine nuclear reactor accidents, and U.S. submarine nuclear reactor accidents. We're through talking about that now because they're zero none zilch. They have been safely operated since 1955, and a whole number of ships and aircraft carriers with ever no nuclear accident in a nuclear Navy ship. <laughs> so they have had some radioactive water spills of, of a minor amount, and we'll claim it to be minor amount. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the Air Force dropping hydrogen bombs all around the world, most of which have been recovered, and there's some still out there. Okay, there may be a question or two. Anybody awake? <laughs> that was a race through civilian reactor power plants. I see a question way back there, Ray. Sort of a dumb question on nuclear wastes and getting rid of it. Uh, I don't know the, the volume that these plants put out, but is it, and um, sending it out to space, just sending out. What if the rocket blows up before it gets out into space? You have a gigantic problem, not, not suitable. Uh, New movie. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Any other questions? What didn't I cover? Surely, my wife has a question. I've got a question. Okay. <laughs> hey, Paula, go ahead. Hey, Walter. Uh, in very interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, who knew there were so many different configurations of power plants, too? That was, that was interesting. Um, I just wondered um, if you could describe what exactly is meant when you say uh, a fuel rod is spent. What exactly does that mean? It means that it's reached its design limit of operation in the reactor to produce fissions, to produce heat. It doesn't mean that all the uranium is burned up. It means that a lot of it is burned up and it has a lot of radioactive um, elements inside the fuel rod, which might interfere with its continuing operation. But basically, it's... It's at that point in the reactor's design where you need to take that one out and put in a new one with uh, more uranium. So, so when you're doing that, I mean, what level of, I mean, what level of shutdown do you have, or are you doing any any shut t shutdown to just add a new rod or do series? It, it has to be shut down. Okay. The uh, in the Navy, the submarines would go into the dry dock. They would cut a big hole in our two-inch thick stainless steel hull and lift that off so they could get access to the reactor. Then the reactor has to be shut down, cooled down, depressurized, and, and it's all kinds of uh, clean room requirement in a dirty shipyard on a dirty submarine in order to open up the reactor and get access to it. Uh, I have not been involved, although my, my ships have been refueled. I was the weapons officer, so I didn't get involved in the re refueling operation. But it takes months. We had a refueling operation on the Alexander Hamilton in 1967. And, yeah, 67. And it took one year. That was a very fast refueling of that reactor and getting the submarine back out to sea 
<clears throat> within about 12 or 13 months. It, it was, I'll claim it and nobody can dispute it. It was a new world's record. Will's got his hand up. Thank you. The flip side of that coin was I was in charge of refueling the PM3A in Antarctica and we did it in one shift. <laughs> you guys were good. How long was Three the shift? Three weeks. <laughs> no. Eight hours? Twelve? Yeah. Uh, different reactor. But Hold on, Miss Whipple. Yeah, I went through a non-refueling submarine overhaul when I was XO, and the ship was in the shipyard for close to three years in a non-refueling overhaul. You said that there were no um, accidents on submarines. Navy sub, U.S. Navy submarines. U.S. Navy submarines, okay. Uh, and then there was a Three Mile Island accident and uh, the, um, what do you call it? Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Both of those run by civilians. Yes. That's, is that difference maybe that on U.S. nuclear submarines, it was a military discipline, and so there was no fooling around or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. I will talk Everybody about Everybody was I'll working. talk about that next week, but basically by the study of Three Mile Island, they instituted the similar kinds of operational reactor safeguards exams on civilian power plants that we have in the Navy nuclear power plants. And they upgraded the training requirements, the supervision requirements, and uh, operational requirements of the civilian reactors. But yeah, it was, it was a training situation. It was a, an operator error. It was an equipment failure, which all of those could have been prevented had they been a better trained set of operators that was not the case in Fukushima. That's totally different. Yeah, that's... Yeah, it was a tsunami. You can't really plan for those, but they tried to. But in the nuclear power plants, the when I was at the prototype in West Milton, New York, it was the destroyer prototype pressurized water reactor. That was when the great blackout happened in the Northeast. And... The requirement was to operate that reactor, you had to have two independent external power sources of electricity to keep the pumps running in order to operate the reactor. We had a diesel generator on site, the great nuclear power, uh, the great electrical blackout in the Northeast in 68, maybe. Uh, we had to shut the plant down. Bang, you're done. Until you get electrical power available, you cannot operate that plant. Same with a nuclear submarine. When our diesel generator was out of commission, we had to be tied up to the tender with electrical power from the tender just to keep our reactor operating at very low power, called self-sustaining. Because the generator didn't run, we couldn't run the reactor. It's part of safety. Did you have your hand up, Pushpa? No. Oh. Can I ask a naive question? Yes. Are we still spending the billions on the fusion efforts? Oh, yes. There's still a big effort going on. And it's, it's R&D. There's no design. I mean, the, the phases you would go through, you'd have a big study program. Then you'd have an R&D, and you'd build kind of a prototype and see if it works, and then go into development. So... Yes, the reward, the reward is fantastic. There, there is essentially no high radioactive pro byproducts of running a fusion reactor. You have tritium, and you make helium, and you have neutrons. Someone had asked me to, earlier to talk about the reactors at universities. I'm not sure what they have now, but... Uh, we had two at Cornell. One was a Triga, T-R-I-G-A, teaching research isotope production by General Atomic. That was in a 30-foot deep pool, pool of open water. And we had the 100-watt reactor that I used. There were just water 
unpressurized moderated reactors. But there have been other reactors around at universities and medical sites to generate isotopes, radioisotopes. They're frequent medical procedures that you will go to where they're going to put some radioactive something in your body because it will allow them to see what they're looking for better. I've had that done. You probably all have had it done. Any other questions? Well, thank you for another wonderful program. Oh, you're quite welcome. And we'll see everybody next week.